Hi, I'm Jody and welcome back to another part about LPQ1. We are speaking about boot the system. Still not a very easy one because I need to wait three because you need to be able to guide the system through the boot process. This is something which we generally just bypass. We start our system and it boots. So we do not have challenges here unless something happens, which is very critical because the system doesn't boot. So having a good understanding of the boot procedure is very essential for any good system admin for you. You need to provide common commands to the bootloader and options. We will speak about it a little bit, but we have a separated section later on another chapter about the boot, booting the system and grub and everything. So we will see more there. Demonstrate knowledge of the boot sequence from BIOS to boot completion. Okay. Understanding system five in it, system five in it, and system D, awareness of upstart and check boot events in the logs. I will cover more than what is needed generally because it's very important to have a good understanding of the whole thing. We already have spoken about this. We have a hardware and we need to load the OS and later we need to load our software, load like our games, development environment or whatever. How this happens? Everything starts with a firmware as I already spoke about. Firmware are between hardware and software, or better say, hardware and software. This is hardware. You have your hardware here, actual circuit boards, motherboard, everything, and you have your software here. Your software needs to understand this, even if your software is your operating system. We have one firmware here, which is in the middle, and it helps a lot in this kind of stuff can you hear this truck let it pass and we will continue even if you have a truck all day all the older days you used to create design plan for an engine your engine was very crucial for your truck you had to inject fuel from here inject air from here mix them with each other and ignition and your truck was moving. This is a huge truck. And your truck was moving. Okay. An engineer would plan how much of this should go here, how much of this could, should go there for the best performance. Hope you can still hear me. In older, older days, someone would create a completely mechanical system to mix this. In a newer years, say 20 years ago, an electronic engineer would create a circuit so it could control how much fuel would go here, how much air would go here. But after a while, they would see, okay, this is not a very good combination. We need a new circuit to make it better. So a new era came. In this new era, you would have everything digital and you would have a valve here and a valve here for fuel and air. And software could control how much of this should work with how much of this. This way, your firmware was controlling this. When you have a smart watch, you may get an update and things suddenly get better. New features, less battery usage, and everything is cooler. Why? Because not everything is used by, is controlled by electronics purely. You have a general computer here, it has some inputs, and you have a firmware which controls how it should work. So a better firmware may have a better battery life because it's uh, managed battery life better, less wake-ups and everything. This is why firmwares are eating the world. Even your oven, your car, and everything does have a firmware. So you have your motherboard here, and it has a firmware on it and a hard disk attached here. You attach the power plug and computer starts to boot. Firmware starts to run. Firmware does a power on self-test, power on self-test, post-test. 
This is when you see the RAM is counting. The screen shows that RAM is OK, CPU is OK, booting from the hard disk. This is very fast and nowadays we won't see it much. Motherboard firmware boots and does a power self test. When it knows that, OK, hardware is OK, it goes and starts a program which is called boot loader. It's a program inserted somewhere on the hard disk. Why we are not starting the operating system directly? First, because of all time limitations. It was difficult to start the whole Linux system from a BIOS uh, firmware. BIOS was not uh, strong enough to load the whole uh, Linux kernel. So we had to start a bootloader and tell the bootloader to load the kernel. There are other reasons too. For example, if you have a problem in your kernel for any reason, you do an update, you do a change, and you make a problematic kernel. In that case, your computer won't boot at all. Nowadays, even if you break the kernel, your computer boots into the bootloader and, may, and gives you the possibility to give some commands. So you can go and check your kernel, change your kernel, use an older version of the kernel. So this is good. Even if you have a dual boot computer, your boot loader will understand, ah, oh, there is a Windows too. So it can, you, can, you, you can choose between Windows and one specific kernel in different Linuxes, different hearts. So it uh, gives you a better control. Your motherboard boots, it does a post test, power on self test. Then it loads the boot loader. Then boot loader loads the kernel. So your hardware does have a firmware. Your firmware loads the bootloader. Bootloader loads the operating system, which is called kernel, which is called Linux. Kernel is the core of operating system. You have to have an understanding of the Linux vs GNU Linux. Linux is only a kernel made based on the POSIX standard, which, is, which defines a Unix system. So Linux is a uh, Unix-like kernel of an operating system. But it needs other tools to work properly. It needs a command line. It needs a copy command. It needs a graphical interface and every other things. GNU project provides many of them. So the correct way to tell what Ubuntu is, what Fedora is, what Debian is, what Red Hat is, is to tell it's a GNU Linux because it has a kernel Linux with GNU tools. But for simplicity, sometimes we call the whole thing Linux and say, do you have a Linux CD to borrow me? To lend me? Anyway. <laughs> okay. So in this specific time, when I'm saying Linux, I mainly and specifically mean Linux kernel. Bootloader loads the Linux kernel. Linux kernel should take control, but it needs some additional data. So it has a file which is called init RAM FS. Initialization RAM file system. It's like a disk in the memory which has some drivers, some needed things for the kernel to start. So when the system boots, firmware loads the bootloader, bootloader loads the kernel and gives it the init RAM FS. So now kernel knows how to control the hardware. It can start everything and run everything from here. If it's a web server, it can start a web server. If it's a desktop, it can start the graphical system. But this is not a very good... Uh, architecture because you don't want to bloat everything into the kernel. So in modern systems and in old systems, Linux kernel only runs a process which is called init. Init runs and initializes everything else you need, like web servers, like network time protocol to set the time based on the internet server, like SSH to make you pos make it possible to connect to the server using a SSH command, like graphical interfaces or whatever you want. So I will review for the last time. I lie. I will review later. Maybe. Your hardware starts, firmware loads, bootloader 
starts, operating system loads, and in its loads whatever is needed afterwards. Sorry for the long, long, long intro, but it's good to have a clear understanding of everything. As I talked in the previous chapter, we have two different uh, firmwares are being used nowadays. BIOS, basic input output, it is older and as we talked, it can only load a program on the first sector of the first hard disk. Although from the configurations, you can say if you want to start the system from an external or internal hard disk or SSD, from a CD, DVD, USB flash or network server. But in any case, it loads only one sector and a very small program. And it is old with other problems. So the hardware vendor switched to a more modern system. It used to called EFI. Now it is called UEFI. It started in 90s by Intel. Now everyone accepted it. And they are working on the unified extensible firmware interface. This is fancier. I showed you some screenshots on the previous section, previous lesson. It can show you how fast your RAM, your fan is running, how much RAM you have. And more importantly, it can boot the system not from the MBR, which was very small, not from the master boot record as BIOS did, but it can boot your system from a separated partition on your hard disk. This partition can have any size. It uses FAT, so it can be 100 megabytes. In Linux system, it is located at boot EFI. And the files extensions are EFI. On the modern Linux systems, if you have a boot EFI and .EFI file, that's where your UEFI firmware looks for to boot the uh, system. And as I said, it doesn't have the limitations of the BIOS. So you can have larger operating system, larger bootloaders with no problems. That partition is called EFI system partition or ESP. On your Linux system, you can check slash sys slash firmware slash EFI and see if you have a EFI firmware or not. I have already done this because I recorded it once and lost the files. You can go to the etc sys Firmwares, note I'm pushing tab to do the autocomplete. LS, and here you can see that these are the only firmwares I have. I don't have an EFI firmware. So my system is not using EFI, so it is using BIOS. And it's because I'm using a virtual machine. Virtual box still uses BIOS. So now you have a better understanding of the hardware and how firmware loads the chair, loads the bootloader, sorry. What the bootloader does. As I told you, bootloader is a small program which loads the next stage. Sometimes you have a two-stage bootloader because on the BIOS, you, have a, you had a, only one sector for your bootloader. So you had a two-stage bootloader. First stage was only one sector, which was loading the main bootloader, and main bootloader was loading the kernel. And let's combine these two to make it faster. So firmware, bootloader. Bootloader needs to load the kernel. As I've already told you, kernel also needs some drivers and those kind of stuff. Those are in the initram fs. The most famous bootloader we use nowadays is called Grub. We used to have something called Lilo, which was part of the previous LPIC exams, but it doesn't apply anymore. Very old. Now when we are speaking about of old bootloaders, we are talking about Grub version 1. When we are speaking about the recent or current, even it's better than recent, uh, bootloaders, we are speaking about Grub version 2. We have a separated chapter for Grub later, so I won't bother you much at the moment. So firmware, bootloader, which is Grub, and it loads kernel. As I told you, kernel needs some drivers to start. So it loads the 
initram fs initram fs each time you run grub to configure a new kernel or whatever it finds the correct kernel it creates or finds the correct initram fs combines these two in one configuration and puts it in its own configuration so when the system boots you will see a grub command which asks you which kernel you want to load and behind the scenes it means which initram fs for that kernel which can it's like a ram disk which contains initialization drivers to let kernel read other data and uh, other hardware and other understand them. also from the grub you can send some configurations to the kernel for example one very useful configuration is s if you add s to the kernel configuration we'll see this in the grub section later chapters or one single user mode or single user this will boot your Linux into one single user mode and tells kernel just to ask for the root passwords and go there. Don't go any further. This is for maintenance or for example if you pass the VGA equals 792 it tells the computer a kernel to only use this graphical mode. So this is a very low resolution and you will make sure that your monitor is working correctly if you system doesn't boot up it can be a graphical issue so this will help you troubleshoot that now you have a good understanding hopefully of the whole process of the boot how the power on test is done by firmware then the bootloader then the linux kernel it loads its configs and kernel loads other file systems and run the initialization program which is responsible to start other softwares okay so kernel runs init program and init program starts other things let's finish this part and go to the command line and show some commands and fiddle with these things and go a little bit deeper